I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel, which today comes from Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. This is immediately after Jesus was baptized by John. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, God will command the angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all of these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Then the devil left them and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Whenever I see a movie where Jesus is a character being portrayed, I'm always very skeptical. And I suppose we should all be skeptical of any depiction of Jesus that we might see or hear about in a sermon by a pastor. And if skeptical feels like too strong a word, then perhaps it should be a certain degree of caution, a certain degree of an open-ended questioning to test out what we're about to see or hear about who Jesus was. I felt a bit more than skeptical when I was watching a movie years ago, a movie which in of itself carried its own controversies. It was titled The Last Temptation of Christ, and it was based on a novel by the same name. Now, to be fair, the very beginning of the movie, there's a title, the titles say, this is a novel, it's not the scriptures. And yet it had Jesus and the disciples and the story sounded pretty much like what we know about in the scriptures. And then there's this scene early in the film which depicts Jesus going into the desert in what turns out to be a period of temptation. Jesus had gone to the desert and was having a conversation with God, was trying to have a conversation with God. It seemed like a frustrating one-way conversation with Jesus talking and God silent. It doesn't portray like a calm time of prayer, but it was almost like an argument. It's, just, it's almost like you walked into the middle of a fight. And Jesus finds a flat spot in the desert and with a stone begins to draw on the rocky terrain a circle, maybe 10, 12 feet in diameter, and Jesus in the middle. And he sat and he waited. And then came the temptations one after the other, each one at night. Jesus knew that days, even weeks, were passing by, and the encounters were clever traps to try to get Jesus to fall for it. The temptations in the film are not quite the temptations we read about in the scriptures, but it is the way in which they were portrayed that just sort of sticks in my head. They were terrifying. First, the cobra half standing up, you know how they do, came and hissed at him some soothing and seductive words to entrap him. 
Then came a lion offering Jesus power. And then came a pillar of fire trying to convince Jesus to misuse his position as son of God. They each tried to get into his head. Each in their own way were saying, I'm just really you. I am just speaking from your heart. This is your voice. But he would not break. And with each temptation, when it was overcome, then the vision just abruptly disappeared. What sticks in my mind is that none of the tempting images ever got in the circle. Jesus sat, the character of Jesus sat in the middle of the circle, or maybe, maybe laid down, or, but he was there in the middle arguing, resisting, but stayed in the center. The portrayal doesn't say why the circle was particularly helpful or protective. It also doesn't say why the tempter decides to play by that rule. And skeptical as one may be about that particular way of looking at the temptations, there's something I find hauntingly true about the portrayal. The tempter wanted to get in his head, even if it would not go in the circle. And in the desert, if you fall for a trap, will anybody even find out? There are no witnesses. It's just you and your shadow. Who's going to tell? Temptations can feel that way. It can feel like, well, no one's watching. The voices that are happening in our head or just outside that safety circle. And after a while, they start making a lot of sense, we have to admit. And so when we read about Jesus in the scriptures, in the gospel, and we read about his temptation, we hear about this confrontation. First, the voice waited until Jesus was starving. And then start working on him, planting doubts in his head. Are you really the Son of God? If you are the Son of God... I mean, really, you look vulnerable, you look tired, you look hungry. Those look like, wouldn't those be like loaves? Those rocks look like loaves. I bet you could make them into loaves. Like a mirage, the voice pointed and hoped that Jesus would fall. But Jesus stood firm. And then the voice mocked him, transporting him to the pinnacle of the, of the temple and trying to force God's hand to protect him, intervene. Throw yourself down. God will pick you up. And Jesus stood firm. And then finally, losing all subtlety, the voice flat out says, just change teams. Be my right-hand man. I wouldn't have left you out here so vulnerable, so hungry. I'll give you power. I will give you wealth. Just renounce God and worship me. But Jesus stood firm. And then the voice left. Jesus kept that voice at bay. Was Jesus inside that circle? Whatever it was, the voice couldn't get in for 40 days. And that's a long time to keep the voice at bay. The drama of these temptations with their rich imagery and their otherworldly <coughs> details sounds at once far-fetched and at once completely relatable. We know that voice. We know that private moment when there is no one else watching. And the voice comes from far away or from very deep inside us. But its purpose is essentially the same, to derail us. To derail, from, derail us from our efforts to be faithful to God, to our family, to our values. To derail us from keeping that streak alive of days or months or years without a drink. To derail us from the progress that we have made ever so slowly patching up a broken relationship. It's a cruel scenario. So much work to stay on track. And then this voice, this thing, this, this, this distraction catches us 
right at the curve, and the train is off the rails. Did anybody see it? Can we manage this one alone? And the train jumps the tracks, and it, it, depending on how fast it is, it may be hard for it to stay upright. And even if we manage to keep it upright, the rocky, so the rocky ground in the desert will bring it to a halt. Did anybody see it? Can we manage this on our own? These 40 days of Lent invite us to a commitment to get back on the track and to dare to journey towards, towards God. And it is daring because the voice doesn't just whisper when we're alone, but it speaks, it pokes, it shames in the most unopportune times, right in the middle of crowd. And it's daring because the voice doesn't give up easily. It doesn't give up at all, actually. But the journey to God is right, and it makes sense. Being on track is when we feel most like ourselves, most like our real, authentic selves. And that journey takes faith and it takes work. It takes commitment and resilience, especially when the distractions come and that curve sneaks up on us and we jump the tracks. But thankfully, thankfully because this is also a journey with God, we know we're not left to our own devices. We know we are loved and forgiven coached and forgiven, encouraged and forgiven, all along the way. Getting derailed is not the end of the journey. It may be incredibly disruptive, it may be just a temporary setback, but the derailment is an occupational hazard. These 40 days are not days to dwell on the shame of having gotten off track but they are meant to be a training ground for knowing what it feels like to have God pick us up and put us back on the right path. And for that, we give God thanks.